So it probably doesn't come as any surprise to say that the vintage Kenner Star Wars figures are among my favorite collectibles ever, my favorite toys, and of course my favorite toy among those is this uh, vintage Jabba figure. And since I'm also very interested in 3D printing, I thought, uh, you know, it would make sense to try and combine those two together. Uh, in a previous video, I showed how I was able to take this uh, vintage Amanaman Man figure, or a scan of it, rather, and print it and paint it and make a very convincing replica, which you see here on the right. And I was wondering if I could do the same with Jabba. I did not, unfortunately, have a 3D model to work with, so I got in touch with uh, Desert Octopus, who is the guy who scanned the Amanaman Man figure that I made in that video, and a bunch of other Kenner Star Wars and other vintage toys and stuff like that, and I ended up sending him uh, one of my many vintage Jabba's to scan. And he did, in fact, do that very quickly, and made what I think is a very impressive scan, very highly detailed. And so I'm going to use that today to show you how I can replicate this vintage Jabba figure using 3D printing. In fact, here's a little surprise for you. This thing you see here in the back is actually, in fact, the model that I printed and painted. And I'm going to show you today how I did that. The model I showed you a second ago is all one piece, but the actual model I'm printing for this project is split up into various parts. As you see here, we have the head, body, tail, arms, and a pin that goes between the tail and the body there. I was kind of lucky that the original figure was split up in this way because all of the parts basically fit on the print bed of my Elegoo Mars and longer Orange 30 resin 3D printers. However, I did have one problem with the head, as you can see here. This part in red here means that it's outside the bounds of the printable area, and that means uh, basically it don't fit on the bed. And no matter how I turn this part around or try and orient it on different axes, it will not fit on the bed of my printer with this large peg part on the bottom. So I had to remove that, unfortunately. But once I did that, I was able to just barely make it fit. So here we have the modified model in Chitu box with the supports added. You can see that I have uh, hollowed out the model and also added a large hole in the bottom here. Instead of adding just small drainage holes, I figured a very large hole would make everything easier and I, I think that did turn out to be the case. The main body was also a little bit challenging. At first glance, it might look like it will never fit on the print bed here. You know, even if you turn it this way, it's going to be lopping over on every side. But if you put it up on its end like this and then spin it around thusly, you can just barely fit it all on the print bed. Of course, when you have such a tall print like this on a resin printer, it ends up taking quite a bit of time. I don't remember exactly how long it was, but it was at least 12 hours to print this. Uh, but for the most part, it came out pretty well. I did have a couple of issues, as I'll show you in a minute, but eventually I was able to iron those out. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the parts that I printed. Here we have the head, and it came out really well, I think. The detail is very impressive. Uh, now the part there on the bottom is of course missing because I cut it off. Uh, in addition to being problematic for printing, that part also ended up not really quite fitting into the body as intended, I think. So for this version anyway, I was not able to replicate the action feature as Desert Octopus had designed it. I was pretty impressed with uh, how he had come up with a solution for that. Now if you may recall, well you probably don't, but <laughs> in my video about the vintage Java figure I showed a cutaway figure that allowed you to see the inside of the action feature there. And you can see it's actually quite involved in here that allows you to have the, the head and tail move with each other. Uh, that may be probably too difficult to recreate with 3D printing, but uh, Desert Octopus came up with, as I say, a fairly clever solution that doesn't quite work in reality, but I think will work with a little tweaking. We have this uh, sort of paddle on the end of the tail that is meant to engage with a hole in the bottom of that peg there. And then, uh, you know, when we turn the head, the 
tail will move. Uh, I, as I say, I, I'll try and get that working later on. Aside from that, though, the parts do fit together well. The arms, for example, uh, do fit into each other pretty well, I think. Uh, you can see that the model here has pegs just like the original figure does, and the arms have little holes there for receiving them. And in fact, this is exactly the way the original Java figure was made. Uh, the only difference, of course, is that the arms and the head here are made of a more rubbery material than the body is, so that uh, it has a little bit more give than this very hard plastic here. So, uh, you know, it's never going to work quite as well, probably, with 3D printed resin, but it's, it's good enough, I think. It doesn't break, and it allows you to pose the arms, so I'm happy with it. In fact, the one over here on the right, I can't get off the peg, and I was reluctant to try too hard, and I didn't want to break the peg off, so I just left it on there. So if we want to go ahead and uh, assemble this for you, I will put the head on top of the body. Now, for now, I'm just sort of setting it here and having it rest there by gravity. Uh, I'm going to, I think, eventually come up with some way to affix it there without the peg. The tail, at first glance, looks like it won't fit in there, but you can squeeze the body just a little bit, and there's enough give in the resin that it does fit in there and actually fits quite well, very similar to the way the vintage figure fits. And you've got this hole here where you can uh, put the peg. Now I ended up printing this at 100% and it's a little too big to fit in, so I had to trim a little bit of the peg away. I would probably recommend printing at 95% or something like that. Uh, you know, just it's very tight even with a little bit of trimming, but I did get it in there. And there we go, we got the whole thing together. And it looks quite impressive, I think, in gray, actually. Now, I did have a number of problems printing this at first. Uh, to give you one example, this is an earlier version that I printed of the body, and you can see that there's a big hole in the bottom there. That was because I had it oriented uh, upright like this, as I showed you, but it was a little too close to the unprintable area, apparently, even though I don't think it's actually showed that on screen. And, you know, just left a big hole there, unfortunately. I also had the tail fail a couple of times until I realized that you need to have the uh, paddle end sort of facing upward instead of downward. Uh, you know, just little things like this. But I did eventually get a model that I was pretty satisfied with. Recreating the vintage Java figure in this way was kind of a challenge that I set for myself, but in reality it's not something that I really need to do. You know, it probably ends up costing more, and it's definitely more work, than just, you know, using one of the original figures. They're not super valuable or rare or anything. Uh, but, you know, having a 3D model of this figure is very useful, though, because you can change the model printed at different sizes, make different things out of it. And so uh, while I was at it, while I was printing some things, I decided to go ahead and print this at some different sizes just to see what it would look like. So the first thing we're going to look at is a one-half scale version of this model, and I think uh, it came out really well. You can still see all of the detail there. You may recall that in my 3D printed Amanda Man video, I printed him at one-half scale as well, which is what you can see right here. So, you know, they look kind of cool together. I definitely think that one-half scale seems to be a, a nice, uh, you know, medium scale for these vintage figures to be printed at, and I'd like to explore that some more in the future. Here we have one quarter scale, I believe, and you can still see all of the detail pretty much there. I was pretty impressed by that. Now one thing I should mention is that both of these models, unlike the large one, have been uh, sort of all joined together. The parts have been all joined together by Desert Octopus at my request because, uh, as you may recall, the body on the large job there is hollow. To begin with, and if you have a hollow model like that that you print at a smaller scale, it's going to have uh, just paper thin walls basically, and it'll be too too thin really, and there's no point in doing it that way. So I just asked him to uh, give me a version of this where it was all sort of connected together, and I'm hoping that he'll be able to make that available to people who buy the model as well. I'm not sure about that. It definitely did make it easier to print these just all at one go instead of trying to deal with a bunch of microscopic parts like arms and things like that. 
give you a little closer look at the one quarter scale version here. And I do think at this scale, you can still pretty much make out all of the details. But when you go a little bit smaller, like with this one, which I think is probably one tenth scale, I can't recall for sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's starting to struggle a little bit as my camera is st <laughs> starting to struggle to focus as well. But you can, if you look closely, still see the details. The final one I tried printing was, I think, 5%, although I wouldn't swear to it. And it is just incredibly tiny, and it's kind of reduced to just the body and the arms. But, you know, you can still sort of tell what it's supposed to be, which is impressive in and of itself. So anyway, now that we have all of these printed, I, uh, I want to go ahead and, and see if I can't paint them to look like the actual vintage Java figure. So the first step was to just spray these with a gray primer. I might have chosen a white primer if I had it available to me, but this is all I had at the moment. And this is just a, a regular primer, as I said, as opposed to a filler primer that I use with some other projects. We don't want to fill in any of that detail. And this just helps the paint sort of stick to the figure. Once the primer had dried, I decided to go ahead and use one of these smaller scale ones as my tester just because it would be easier to cover it all with a little a bit of paint, and if I made a mistake, I wouldn't be hard to cover it up. And I'm using these uh, Army Painter War Paints, acrylic paints, but really any acrylic paints will probably work just fine. I didn't end up, end up using most of these. This was just uh, sort of experimental. I was trying to duplicate the color of this plastic here, which is sort of a weird mustard yellowish brown color. And then also we have on the front, which you may not be able to tell, uh, there's actually a little bit of yellow paint on the actual vintage Java figure. You can see on this one here, the cutaway one, it's more yellow. They put a thicker layer of paint there. There's a fair amount of variation from figure to figure. You can see the back is more of a brown, whereas the front is a, a yellow, and that's because of the paint. So I'm going to try and recreate that same color scheme and you know general look of the vintage figure as closely as I can. First of all I tried mixing one of the lighter browns and some yellow and then I decided uh, to go with oak brown and yellow and that seemed to be a good combination to use. I believe I'm using demonic yellow in their naming scheme but really any sort of primary yellow would work. And we combine those two together to get what I consider to be a pretty decent match there. Uh, you know, I did adjust it a little bit as I went along. As I mentioned in my Amana Man video, the, uh, the first layer is always going to look terrible, pretty much. Especially when you're using a darkish gray primer as I am here. It's going to show through and it's going to look bad. But, you know, just do a single layer and then come back and do another one on top of that and maybe another one on top of that and you'll have nice coverage. So that's what I did here, and then I was able to concentrate on maybe adjusting the actual coloring a little bit better. Once I thought I had the basic color down, I went ahead and did the smaller figures as well, which didn't take very long at all. This one here, and of course the tiniest one in particular, were almost laughably fast. After finishing a couple of coats on the little figures, I decided to go ahead and paint the big one as well, but the process was pretty much the same. Just put on a couple of layers and try to make it as smooth as possible so it doesn't look like it's been brushed on. If I put this back on the body, you can see that there is a difference between the coloration of the head and the body there. And I'm going to go ahead and add that to his belly as well. I found that adding a tiny bit of red to the paint helped me get the uh, exact color that I needed, especially for the highlight areas. And here you can see I'm just kind of taking the paint and putting it in you know, strategic places and highlighted areas. Not actually trying to add highlights per se, because we don't want to make this look like a realistic Jabba. We want it to look like the actual figure does as much as possible. So just kind of going in there, adding a little of the uh, orangish yellow there. It's a subtle effect, but you can tell in person. I didn't realize I wasn't recording when I started painting these eyes in, but basically I just uh, painted them red and then added a little bit of a, a black pupil in the middle there. 
The actual vintage Java figure has a kind of transparent lens over his eyes that I tried to recreate by applying some gloss coat over the eyes. This goes on milky, but it will dry clear. I did have to put several coats of it on to make it thick enough to really see and to kind of resemble the lenses on the Java figure. And I did the same for the smaller scale versions as well. So as I said, here is the finished product. And if we want to see it next to an actual vintage Java, we can put one there. It's a little hard, I've found, to get two Jabba's on the screen at once because of their long tails, but uh, you know, you get the idea here. Now, you, as I mentioned, I think earlier, there's some variation in the paint on the vintage Jabba figures, so some will look different than others. But I think, uh, especially if you're just looking at this on its own, in isolation, it looks uh, very convincing. And we can take a, a bit of a closer look here at the face. Uh, you can see I did the uh, the gloss on the eyes to try and replicate those clear lenses. And I think it's not a perfect effect, but it is uh, fairly convincing. And I think I also am pretty happy with the difference in color here on the face and belly compared with the tail. The arms do function, although, you know, you have to be a little bit careful with them. This one in particular has a tendency to fall off if you're not careful but it does go back on, and the tail will move as well. Um, I'm still working on the action feature, you know, where you move the head and the tail will move. I haven't quite gotten that to work 100%, but other than that, I'm really, really happy with how this turned out. Um, and I'd also like to show you the smaller versions that I made. So we've got here the half scale, which I think turned out well as well. Look at that. And we've got uh, the quarter scale, I believe this is. When we get to the smaller sizes, the the features are a lot more indistinct, so it you know it's a little harder to to see and to make them stand out with paint. But I tried my best. And we have here whatever this is, maybe twentieth scale. <laughs> Uh, actually, not too bad. I think it looks better this way than I did uh, unpainted. And if I can find my teeniest, tiniest one, here it is. Almost lost him. We have whatever this one is. Oh gosh, I don't even remember what scale this one is. But if we can, <laughs> if we can even see it, come on. There we are. I'll try and have it focus there. There we are. He has little eyes on him. And, you know, given the size, the detail on this is actually pretty impressive. So there we go. All of these guys are 3D printed. And I think, you know, the color and everything, the look overall is what I was trying to recreate. So I'm pretty happy with that. In future videos, I'm going to show some maybe more out there versions of this, not just trying to replicate the original look of the figure, but maybe trying some different uh, materials and things of that nature. If you would like to print one of these yourself, I will put the link to the Cults 3D page where you can purchase this. It's not very expensive. I hope you enjoyed this look at using 3D printing to recreate the vintage Jabba the Hutt figure, and I'll see you again very soon.